Good morning and welcome to the City Council Transportation Committee's hearing on the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget and the fiscal 2018 preliminary mayor's management report. My name is Idanis Rodriguez and I chair the committee. Today we are here to begin the fiscal 2019 budget process, which will lead to the adoption of a budget that should be progressive, responsible, and fair to all New Yorkers. We will start by hearing testimony from the MTA Chairman Joe Loro following a brief recess. The committee will reconvene at 3 p.m. to hear testimony from DOT Commissioner Paul Tombre. Let's begin by giving the floor to our speaker, Corey Johnson. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council, and I'd like to begin by welcoming everyone to today's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget hearing on the Metropolitan Transit Authority and the New York City Transit Authority. Today we'll hear from the chairman of the MTA, Joe Loda. Joe, I appreciate that you accepted my invitation to testify today, and I look forward to collaborating with you to find creative solutions for our public transit problems that will benefit residents of the city. Ronnie, it's good to see you as well. Uh, thank you also to council member and chair Donis Rodriguez, chair of the Committee on Transportation for holding this hearing and for continuing to be a leader for efficient, affordable, and accessible transportation across the five boroughs. Everybody knows that the state of our subways is currently unacceptable and does not meet the needs of a first-class city like New York. Like the millions of other New Yorkers who rely on the subways to get to work, I took it here this morning. I took the three train from 14th Street. It was packed, packed like sardines. Like people couldn't get in the car, it was so packed. They had to wait for the next train. So for folks who take subways to get to work, to doctor's appointments, and to pick up their kids each day, I can personally attest to the fact that things are getting worse. Subway platforms and cars are more crowded, as I said. The delays are excruciating, and information for frustrated riders in the past has been non-existent, and I know you're changing that. And at the same time, the quality of service has been declining, and fares have been increasing, for some to unaffordable levels. And while that is but a brief description of the problems, at today's hearing, we are here to focus on solutions. Last summer, after a number of high-profile and dangerous incidents, the governor declared a state of emergency for the New York City subway system. In response, Chairman Loda unveiled a subway action plan in an effort to stabilize and improve the system while laying the foundation for modernizing the subways. The action plan sets forth two phases. Phase one, which the MTA promised would begin immediately and deliver results within one year, will expedite signal repair, accelerate the repair of potential track issues, increase the frequency of station cleaning, increase car reliability, and revise customer communications protocols. Phase two will detail long-term system-wide improvements, such as adopting a new signal system and purchasing better subway cars. This type of action plan is long overdue, and the council commends the MTA for putting forth specific proposals to address short and long-term goals for fix fixing the system. However, before the city jumps in feet first to support the plan, there are several critical issues that need to be addressed. First is the issue of funding. Phase one of the action plan costs $836 million, and the state assumes half the cost will be borne by the city. As I stated in my testimony before the state legislature last month, while it is true that city residents benefit immensely from the subway system, we are hardly its sole beneficiaries. Tri-state residents from all over the region rely on the subway when they come to city for work or for play. Given the significant contribution the city and its residents already make to the transit system, it is hardly fair to ask the city to be the only municipality to have to chip in. That being said, I do support some level of additional contribution to the subway action plan and the larger MTA capital budget by the city. This might include a new revenue stream, such as congestion pricing, or a direct subsidy. However, I do think that any direct subsidy should be a one-time occurrence rather than on a recurring basis because doing otherwise would lead us down a slippery slope. But regardless of the form that such a financial support may come in, it is absolutely imperative that the city's money go directly to improving the subways and nothing else. This cannot be another opportunity 
for the state to siphon the city's money away for other priorities. And as I've said before, the city's contribution must go into a lockbox, preferably one without a key. I know you, Chairman Loda, have said this money would go directly to the subway system in New York City and nowhere else in the MTA uh, budget. Clearly, increased accountability has to go hand in hand with a guarantee from the MTA on the use of the city's funds. In exchange for any contribution, the MTA will have to agree to complete transparency and regular reporting. Funds, needed to, funds need to be spent efficiently with clear timelines and appropriate oversight. This is non-negotiable. Lastly, the city is not interested in funding superficial station renovations that do nothing to improve service. The city must be assured that infrastructure upgrades and signal modernization will take priority over other types of projects. The council has been encouraged by Chairman Loda's willingness thus far to work with the city council to address our concerns and priorities, and I look forward to continuing that partnership over the next months and years. Let me finish with this. Uh, I'm really glad you're here. I'm glad that you and your team uh, came the other day to Democratic Conference to answer questions about the subway action plan and to answer questions about individual members' concerns. Uh, it is great to work with you. Uh, I really appreciate it. People just want goddamn results. That's all they want. People want subways that work for them. People want to be able to get to work on time. People want a system that's gonna work. And people, what people do not want, and what I don't want, is to be in the middle of a political squabble uh, from Albany and from the city. I care about results. I care about getting things done for the six million uh, riders that take it every day and anything that this council can do to help that help make that happen we stand uh, willing and excited to do so uh, but the the gamesmanship uh, is unacceptable uh, for us uh, we I take the subway literally almost every single day I've taken the subway every day for uh, the past 18 years so I've never owned a car I know what it's like to be a strap hanger on a daily basis. And the, the needs that exist, of course, are gigantic. Uh, but uh, it's my hope that we will get things done in the short term and in the long term. Now, of course, we're going to focus on the subway action plan, as I mentioned in my opening statement. But the larger question here is how do we modernize our subway system so that it is a 22nd century subway system that befits a world-class city like New York City? How do we do that? I don't want us to take our eye off the prize, which is the short-term improvements that need to be uh, made, of course, are key, but I don't want to come back in two years or three years from now and have a similar conversation. I want us to come up with a long-term plan that will get the revenue necessary to fix the system. I, I saw, uh, Chairman Loda, that in the news the last few days that you're potentially pushing for a vote on the MTA board for congestion pricing. Uh, you're shaking your head. I guess the news is wrong. Um, well, I would welcome that because I support congestion pricing. Uh, but I think the immediate thing that we could do is actually put a surcharge on four higher vehicles. That could raise us some immediate revenue, which could go into the MTA. But beyond a four higher vehicle surcharge, I support a broad and robust congestion pricing plan, which will disincentivize cars from coming into Manhattan be enough of a charge that it raises a significant amount of money for the MTA while at the same time disincentivizing cars and your leadership and the MTA's leadership and helping make congestion pricing a reality is key. Uh, I speak on congestion pricing as an individual, not for the entire body. There are members that still have issues with the plan and we will of course talk about those issues uh, moving forward and I respect my colleagues in the process uh, and how they need it addressed. But again, I'm grateful that you're here. I'm grateful that you came the other day. I have a series of questions for you, and I want to turn it back to my friend and the chair of this committee, Chair Adonis Rodriguez. Thank you, as Speaker, uh, for your leadership at the Council, especially when it comes to transportation and for giving me the opportunity to chair the Transportation Committee. And following what the Speaker said, uh, we have seen a new bridge, Mario Como Bridge, built not so expensive and on time. 
We have seen LaGuardia Airport going through major renovation. We have seen UPK for all the lowest numbers of crime in the city. So when they stay in the city, listening to New Yorkers, we can we get things on time and with less funding. Now it's our time to listen to the frustration of the 8.5 million New Yorkers and the visitors and really take our transportation system to the 21st century, making it more efficient and safer for everyone. The MTA's calendar 2018 adopted operating budget is balanced and include more than $1 billion in city subsidies. The authorities proposed 2015, 2019, $32.4 billion capital program appears fully funded. We look forward to having the chairman update the committee on this stage of the transit system and its funding sources. Due, due to a year of negligence, Overcrowding and delays have become the new normal, creating a strain on the social and economic well-being of our residents. This is unacceptable, and I know that this is something that the chairman and his team understand. We hope that the MTA will elaborate on the details of their subway action plan, the progress it has made in the first eight months of the plan, and what changes should we expect in the next four years. A deficient subway system has real human and economic impacts. An over overwhelming majority of New Yorkers blame subway delays for being late to work, doctor's appointments, school, and be with their families. These delays cost New Yorkers hundreds of millions of dollars. Most of the time, they happen because of failure in our old signal system or track fire like the one we saw yesterday at 96 Street on the one line. Our updated system is keeping hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers with disabilities from fully participating in our economy and navigating our city with oftentimes much longer commutes. Our bus system has not been able to provide reliable services and reach New Yorkers in transportation deserts. Bus ridership has declined 21% over the past 15 years. Some of that is due to updated bus routes and the lost opportunity of no employing technology to enforce clear bus lanes. As we make this transition to the new fare payment system, I look forward to the MTA making a real commitment to implementing all door boarding to ensure passengers can get on the bus much more quickly. New Yorkers and visitors demand and deserve a 21st century transportation system. We need to think bigger and bolder, not just when it comes to investment, but procurement policy as well. Excessive costs and project delivery delayed are persistent in capital improvement projects, and the MTA must increase transparency because the public should know how tax dollars are spent. We expect a lot from the chairman and the rest of the new leadership at the MTA. We look forward to hearing how the MTA's budget reflect the urgency and diligence with which this crisis must be addressed. Before we hear from the MTA, let me take a moment to recognize my colleagues who have joined us this morning. Uh, they are uh, Councilmember Diaz, Van Bramer, Yeager, Dodge, Lander, and Menchaca. Uh, now we will hear from the MTA chairman and his team. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, and members, I'm all sorry. the members of City Council who are here. Give me one second, if you don't mind. We need to. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to administer the uh, affirmation. Okay. Please raise your right hand. Joe, you don't have to stand up. <laughs> I do it. Actually, I like that. We're going to require that moving forward. You can't swear the truth unless you're scared. Yes. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? So help me God, yes. <laughs> Thank you. We're holding you to that. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and members of City Council. Uh, my name, as you can imagine, is Joe Loda, Chairman of the MTA. With me to my left is uh, Ronnie Hakem. She is the MTA Managing Director. 
Uh, to her uh, left is Doug Johnson. He is the budget director for the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Uh, at, we are here at uh, Council Speaker Corey Johnson's invitation to discuss the mayor's fiscal year 2018 preliminary budget as it relates uh, to the, uh, actually the 2019 preliminary budget as it relates to the MTA. This year's MTA operating budget is about $16 billion. Close to $1 billion of that will come from uh, directly from the New York City budget, representing 6.5% uh, uh, of our overall budget. Funding directly from uh, the New York City budget, monies which are only used in the City of New York, support the operations of MTA New York City Transit, MTA Bus, and the Staten Island Railroad. It is also used to maintain commuter rail stations located within the five boroughs. The breakout of the $1 billion in operating funding from the City is as follows. $45 million to partially offset free and reduced fares for New York City school children. This amount has remained flat since 1996, in spite of the fact that we've had numerous increases in fares over that time. $14 million for our reduced fare uh, program for the elderly. This amount has also remained flat, however, since 1978. $189 million for paratransit, representing just 35 percent of its cost. $95 million for station maintenance for the 36 commuter rail stations that are located in the five boroughs. $161 million to pay local match for state aid payments. $498 million to reimburse the MTA for the cost of MTA bus, the agency that was created uh, at the request of the city to run the formerly franchised private bus lines. And finally, $64 million to partially offset the MTA for the cost of the Staten Island Railway. In general, much of what we get from the city's budget is tied to formulas. I might add, inequitable formulas. As a result, the percentage burden borne by the city has decreased dramatically over the years. Paratransit, I believe, is a perfect example. The money we get from New York City to finance paratransit operations is capped at 120 percent of the prior year reimbursement, in spite of the fact that there are ever-increasing number of users, much greater than 120 percent per year, of paratransit riders. Uh, this is what the formula has meant to the MTA over the years. In 1994, paratransit cost a total of $15 million. The MTA paid $8 million of that, representing 53 percent of the total. In 2017, these costs went to $474 million, and the MTA paid $288 million, an increase of 3,500 percent, and over $100 million more than the city's share. Along with the weakening operational support for the MTA, New York City's budget does not fund the subway action plan, despite the request from last July, uh, when the plan was introduced to combat declining subway performance. After the governor declared a state of emergency to deal with the delay crisis, our first course of action was clear. We had to start to immediately reverse the decline. That is why, as one of my first acts as chairman, we introduced this plan first to stabilize and then to modernize the subway system. We're implementing the plan's first phase right now. I believe it is working. We are improving wait times, increasing the distance between subway train breakdowns, reducing the number of major incidents resulting from signal track and power failures. We're tracking our progress. We're reporting it to the public on our new dashboard. But let me be clear. I know we are far from being finished. I know we have a long way to go before New Yorkers experience and feel the improvement. I will not be satisfied until I feel the improvement. There are two main reasons why the plan is working. First, the improvements uh, we are seeing can be directly attributed to the extraordinary efforts of our transit workers and their managers working day and night under the plan to install miles of new track, repair thousands of right-of-way and station defects. Second, it's our new leadership team in place for less than a year has dramatically improved the way we schedule and coordinate work along and within our tracks. We've revamped this entire process to maximize productive work time and reduce unnecessary overtime. We are saving even more time by ensuring that we have all of the necessary people and equipment ready to go at the job site exactly when they're needed. The end result is that we are getting more work done more efficiently, more effectively, and saving hundreds of millions of dollars in the process. And we are expanding these new rules to other subway work. 
All new contracts will incorporate all of these new rules. We have been accomplishing meaningful, productive work on the weeknights as well as the weekends, and we're going to get a year's worth of uh, work of deferred maintenance completed this many, many years of deferred maintenance work completed just this year. Governor Cuomo's executive budget includes capital and operating support to fund the state's half of the $836 million subway action plan. The city's budget has not made such a commitment. As a result, the benefits of this plan, uh, as strong as they are to date, have been muted and we will, uh, will be unable to implement the plan as quickly as we originally envisioned it. This lack of support is especially disappointing in light of the analysis issued this past August by the city controller showing the New York City economy is thriving. New York City's economy grew 3.3 percent in the second quarter of 2017. This outperformed the nation's growth rate in the same quarter and is double the city's growth rate from the second quarter of 2016. The number of employed New Yorkers jumped by more than 87,000, the largest increase in more than three decades. These new New Yorkers and newly employed New Yorkers are using our subway system and bus system every day, just like New Yorkers have been doing forever. And it makes me wonder, and a question for you, council members, what better time now to invest in our transit system? What better time to invest in a plan that's working, that's goal is to fix our subways. Uh, and if we can't invest more now, when can we? The challenges facing our nation's oldest transit system stem in no, stem in no small part from the decades of underinvestment. But if there's any good news in these challenges, it's a, that they have spurred a much needed broader look at the weaknesses inherent in the MTA's financing model. They have clearly shown that the MTA needs new and consistent revenue sources because we simply cannot limp from crisis to crisis. In this regard, we are encouraged by the robust conversation happening about congestion pricing as a solution to both the city's traffic woes and the MTA's long-term financing needs. The governor has proposed legislation that would allow the MTA to capture some real estate value that results undeniably and directly from the renewal, enhancement, and expansion of the city's indispensable transit system. And collaboration with the city is absolutely essential. We want to build a stronger partnership with New York City Council to address these long-term challenges because, as everyone here knows, our transit network is fundamental to the economic well-being of the city. It is what allows New York City to have four times the job and population density of the next largest city in this country. It is, the subway system is quite simply the fuel that powers our $1.4 trillion regional economy, which also makes up 11 percent of our nation's GDP. Overall, I'd say the city is getting quite a bargain from its investments in our subway and bus network. To wrap up, members of council, I want to thank Speaker Johnson for the invitation to join you today, Mr. Speaker. The MTA very much looks forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and, and uh, looking forward to working with you and all the members of your committee and all the members of council to strengthen the partnership between the MTA and the City of New York. And I want to once again assure you that I will not be satisfied until the MTA is back on track and that all of our customers, your constituents, have a greater sense of reliability when they get onto our uh, subway and bus system. Thank you for this opportunity. My colleagues and I are happy to answer any and all questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Now let's call on the speaker who has questions, then we will follow with other questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good to see you. Um, the subway action plan, as we understand it, uh, as you said, will help alleviate some of the immediate problems causing delays and overcrowding in the system. The cost for phase one includes, as we said before, $836 million. $508 million is operating costs, and $328 million is capital related, of which the city and state have been called on to split evenly. At this point, the city is not committed to providing that additional funding, even though I remain open to it. Um, what are the contingency plans for the subway action plan if the funding requested from the city is not appropriated? Mr. Speaker, thank you for your support for the plan. Um, the, uh, if, in fact, we don't receive the amount of monies from the city we laid out at the last board meeting uh, of the MTA, uh, the, how we would phase in the subway action plan, it would be stretched out over a longer period of time. The core principle in developing the subway action plan last uh, July 
um, dealt with dealing with it as, in a surge fashion, doing as much as we possibly can to get back to a state of reliability. By not having the full amount of money, we would have to stretch it out over a longer period of time and, um, and therefore, and restagger it. M much of what we've been doing in the Subway Action Plan is hiring workers to get back to the level that we were back in 2008 and 2009. Those workers that were so critically important to maintaining um, uh, the maintenance necessary to keep a system as old as the subway system up and running. Uh, by not being able to hire them as quickly as we would like, the program, as I said, would need to be phased in over time. And if, um, are there other resources on the table, including a reallocation of internal MTA funds? Could you all reallocate what's in your budget right now to cover the subway action plan cost if the city decided not to go 50-50? Well, we, 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 um, we are always constantly looking for ways to be more efficient and effective. We've had a program to eliminate our gap uh, to, the, to the tune of over a billion dollars over the last few years. So not a day goes by when we don't look for ways to reallocate. However, given the size of w what we do and the number of passengers that we have, um, this surge is above and beyond our existing needs. We will do everything we can to try to find the mon funds, but I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that it will be as good as being able to have a partner in the city of New York. So if the city were to contribute the $418 million that the authority is seeking, how much say in the decision-making process would the city have with the subway action plan spending? It sounds like you've already identified everything that you think needs to happen, so how does the city really have a say if the plan has been baked already? Well, I, I'm glad you added that on after the question because I think that's at the core. The plan has been laid out. I'd be more than happy to sit with the city to uh, go over the plan, what we have done to date, what we want to do to date, why we think it's important uh, to get done in the order in which we've put it together. Uh, I'm always willing to sit down and talk to the city, and my job is to convince them that the plan we put together is the, is the right approach. There may be disagreement, and we'll find a way, as I always have, with the city to find a way to compromise. So uh, I think it would be helpful for you to detail for us and for the public, uh, when we look at the, the $836 million uh, that is needed for the subway action plan, 33% uh, of it is for uh, operating costs, 50% for capital costs for car equipment, as it relates to car equipment, 33% for operating costs, 50% for capital costs. Um, and then the, the amount for signals, which the public hears over and over and over again, there are signal problems, there are signal problems, we have delays because of signal problems, is relatively small. Can you explain sure. how you've gotten to the amount you've gotten to for signal-related work and talk about water issues, talk about track repair issues, and how all of those things fit together? A absolutely. When, when you look at the number that talks about the signals, it's talking about directly working with the signals. But you also have to understand that every amount of money that we want to spend on power is directly related to the signals. The power problems, the surges that we've been experiencing from Con Ed have a direct impact on the, uh, on the signalization, on the signals that go on. So that, you know, when, you, when I prioritize them into different buckets, each one of those buckets are interrelated. Without any doubt, the overall goal of uh, the subway action plan, the primary goal, if you will, of the subway action plan is to deal with signals. Water is having to deal with signals. Power has to deal with signals. The line item that's called signals directly relates to the box and the red, green, and yellow, yellow lights that are on the side. That's the direct hardware and the work necessary. All of it is uh, dealing pretty much with signals. The same with track. Um, uh, direct, is, is directly related to signals. So the isolation that the dollar amount that's only related, that is uh, identified as signals, is, is not the correct way to look at it. What, do you what, want? What's that amount of money for signals? That's, that's specifically for signals that's put into the subway action plan? So, um, okay. so there are, um, as the chairman noted, there are two uh, types of money that is included in the subway action plan, the operating budget money and supported also by a capital program investment. So in our capital program, 
um, for the subway action plan, there's a specific line item for $34 million for signal modernization. But that's not the, that's not the in entirety of what we're investing in signals. We're also improving the infrastructure. So a signal breaks, it malfunctions if water drips on it. So we have to manage our water problem in the subway system as well. The signal breaks, it malfunctions if there's a defect in the, the circuitry that touches that signal, that travels the power to that signal. So we have to address the power in the circuitry as well. So the numbers actually, totality, get closer to $200 million of that 836 that we've been talking about in the subway action plan. That's helpful. I would also add that um, we've got, I believe, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but something like almost $3 billion in the capital plan for signals. Uh, that amount is being retooled uh, and has been since I've been back to get much more of it done and much more of the system into the new, m new modern systems that we'd be more than happy to talk about. So you recently indicated to the Council that in addition to the approximately uh, $418 million uh, for the subway action plan, you're also requesting approximately $150 million per year in future years to support the subway action plan, which is primarily in operating costs related to new personnel that would come on for the plan. However, when you announced the subway action plan last summer, you stated that you were asking the city and state to fund the initial costs and that you would, quote, do your best to find efficiencies and revenues necessary to go out in future years. So what has changed since then? Why are you now asking the city to help fund those future year costs? The future year costs are not the total amount of the costs. We are finding funding uh, for, for the differential between the two. Um, the, the, um, on, yeah, we will continue to always have what I call programs to eliminate our out-year gaps or out-year uh, projected deficits um, because that's the only way to keep the system as efficient and, and as effective as possible. Has the state agreed to fund those future year costs as well? We've had discussions with the state. As you know, unlike the city, they don't do four-year financial plans and because of uh, the Financial Control Act and the requirements. We actually do follow the city the way the city does its uh, budgeting and financial plans at the MTA. So it's hard to, you know, we've had discussions with the state that this is an ongoing program, but whenever you talk to them, they always say it's one year at a time. Uh, during the last vote at the MTA's capital plan uh, amendment uh, to include the governor's station improvement plan, the city's four representatives were forced to vote no on the entire plan, uh, on the entire plan changes as voting on the plan changes are structured as an all or nothing vote. They couldn't vote on a partial part of the plan. They had to vote on the whole plan and they voted no. If the city's representatives agree with 90% of the plan changes, they would have to vote no on the entire plan for the 10% they weren't in favor of. Would you consider changing this approval structure to allow for partial approvals? Mr. Speaker, may I ask a clarification yes. question there? Because I, I wasn't quite sure which vote you were referring to. I believe I'm, I'm talking about the, the vote related to the subway station enhancements uh, where some of the members did not want to vote for that, so they ended up voting no on everything. Uh, even though they agreed with a lot of the stuff that was in the amendment. There were, two, there were two things I think that you're referring to. There was a recent vote on the Enhanced Station Initiative Program where we were recommending to award two contracts for another set of enhanced stations. Um, the four city members, I think three were in the room actually, chose to vote no, um, which is absolutely within their prerogative. That is not, though, the ultimate plan amendment vote that was taken last spring, where we had everybody's support at that time. Would you consider changing the approval process so that they wouldn't have to vote all or nothing on these amendments? Well, they, they don't have, they, they already have the ability to do that. These were uh, contracts uh, two months ago to implement what they had all voted for originally. Um, and all we were doing, and we break them down into various different component parts. There were three stations. Uh, there were two different, uh, two, 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 contracts. two contracts. Each one had three different stations. Uh, and um, they were voted on uh, on just those, not the entire contract. Uh, 
I I'm asking about the whole capital plan, the capital uh, review board plan. Well, the capital review board, that's, a, that's different. They, they, in fact, did vote in favor of that. They did not vote no in connection with the, capital, with the, cap the overall capital plan. That being said, uh, it is one that, uh, as you know, it comes to the board. It goes before first to the board, and then it goes to the Capital Program Review Board, of which there are numerous negotiations. A little bit of a description. The Capital Program Review Board was set up by the state back in 1981, 82 timeframe, if I recall. And it basically, when it comes to the capital budget, specifically for anything that's in New York City transit, their members uh, include a representative of the governor, a representative of the speaker of the assembly, a representative uh, of the uh, majority in the Senate and a representative of the mayor's office. The rules of the Capital Program Review Board are quite unique uh, within, our, within our government in that any one of the members can veto uh, anything. So it requires us to sit down and negotiate because any one of the members have basically similar to what's, you know, what I consider Security Council rules. If they don't like what's in there, um, they, uh, they can veto it. So it requires everyone to sit down together prior to having that meeting and going through each and every line item to figure out what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, and it is a classic uh, negotiation process that goes on. That's the opportunity for which uh, representatives of the mayor have a clear opportunity to be involved in what's in or what's not in. So the Citizens Budget Commission uh, came out with a report recently, and they said, yet the recent amendment reduced the total state of good repair and normal replacement commitments from $12.7 billion to less than $12.4 billion, decreasing sums dedicated to signals and communication systems, subway cars, and line equipment. So even though, Chairman, you mentioned uh, approximately $3 billion for signal upgrades that was already included in the MTA capital budget, uh, the Citizens Budget Commission is claiming there's actually a decrease as it relates to the much needed improvements yeah. from an infrastructure perspective that we're talking about. You have to be careful about what the Citizens Budget Commission writes. It's actually an increase over the prior capital budget. It is, is on a percentage basis possibly less than what was originally envisioned when the budget came together. But there are, you know, the amount of money that we're spending on new cars, which increased the size of the capital budget, uh, I believe is uh, very important. And so when you look at the total, what they were talking about is just percentages. The dollar amounts are more, but given the cost of what it takes to purchase new cars, the new R R211s, I believe they are, uh, called, uh, you know, just become, you know, we need to get new cars. There's no question. So it's a, you know, it's a, as I said, you've got to be careful. Uh, as I have always been with the Citizens Budget Commission on making sure that you fully grasp, they, they grasp the reality of the situation. And I think it's important to be very specific on this point, um, Mr. Speaker, which is the capital program and the plan amendment that you're referring to includes over 2.7 billion, with a B, dollars for signals. There was a shift of 38 million, with an M, dollars, because of the R211 procurement that the chairman just referenced, which is there is signal equipment that is included on new cars. And some of those new cars are actually not being delivered until the next 20 to 24 right. program. So we allocated the money that is associated with the cars being delivered in the next program. But the ultimate commitment of over $2.7 billion was consistent. So did you all have a chance to read uh, John Raskin's uh, op-ed in the Daily News today? Your staff was good enough to give it to me prior to this. and I Did you read it on the subway right here? Uh, no, no, I, did, I, I don't buy the Daily News. Sorry. <laughs> you don't buy the Daily News? I don't. It's New York's hometown paper. <laughs> I've lived here my entire life, and I, you know, somebody I'm sure in the office has a copy. I will read it. So you it. buy the Times? Actually, um, yes, I do actually buy the Times. <laughs> okay. And I buy the Wall, uh, Wall Street Journal. Well, I can give I you a copy of other the other tablet. No, I but I have you, a copy. You have your a copy. Staff okay, was kind enough. Well, your staff was kind enough to give it to me, and I, in fact, did read it uh, right before. And what did you again. think? Well, I, I um, wish John Raskin spent ten seconds in my shoes to fully understand, uh, as you know, given his background as an advocate and as a. Um, uh, chief of Staff to a State Senator, he does very, very good work, but without sitting in my shoes to fully understand that we've gone through years, possibly decades, 
of underinvestment and disinvestment in the subway system. I think someone referenced before eight months, I counted seven months. Regardless, you know, uh, we, everything we're doing to stabilize the system, to get it into a state of reliability, I think is uh, exactly what I need to do. We are in the process of developing a capital plan, the next capital plan. That next capital plan will include um, monies for new modern signalization, new modern cars, new modern efforts. Uh, we need to do, we, we, we're, we're working on that now. I think the gist of this, the, the, the idea that the MTA rescue plan is a distraction from the much needed overhaul, I think is, is just absurd. It's a combination. Uh, like the mayor, I can do two things. I can walk and chew gum at the same time. I can actually work on a short-term program and a long-term program at the same time. It's, this column is nothing more than a cheap shot. Um, I have a couple more questions, and then I want to hand it off uh, to my colleagues who are all patiently waiting to ask questions. Uh, so you, you're not looking for the MTA to have a vote on congestion pricing. You shook your head when I no, mentioned what, what, So let, here's what happened. At the last meeting, as I end every meeting, uh, and I've encouraged board members now uh, in some separate meetings to take advantage of the fact, do I say are there any, um, any additional questions, comments, business that we need to bring before the board? A board member who happened to be a member of the Fix NYC board said two things. I'd like to have um, the folks who developed and wrote the Fix NYC report to come in and make a presentation to the board. Uh, I'm all in favor of that, the more education process we have. And the second was to have a vote on the plan. Um, you know, it's a good question. What, what does that mean, uh, the vote on the plan? I'm more than happy to have a vote on the plan. However, I do not in any way, shape, or form want to get the MTA board in a position that disagrees with the legislature or the executive. Powers regarding additional funding for the MTA belong with elected officials, not with the board of the MTA. Okay. Board of the MTA's job is to spend whatever they're given efficiently and effectively, and I attempt to do that every second of every day. Do you support so congestion pricing? I have always supported congestion pricing. I supported Mayor Bloomberg uh, in his congestion pricing program of a, probably a decade ago. 2013, I said that congestion pricing should be put on the table uh, when I happened to be uh, doing something else in my life um, and as part of that, but I also said that we need to do certain things before we actually get to congestion pricing. One of the things that I think is really fascinating about the Fix NYC report is that it does it in three pieces. It, uh, there are three particular parts, and the, and the beauty of the particular parts is it requires planning to be done in place. The first part is, hey, MTA, get your act together. Second part is, hey, city, let's deal with the placard problem. And third, MTA and others try to figure out what technology would be necessary if we would implement congestion pricing. I think that planning part of it is very important, and that's what I was talking about in 2013. You just can't go willy-nilly into congestion pricing. You, need, you really need to have it developed in a, in a substantive way, public discussions, public hearings, an understanding of the technology, how would it work, uh, also, you know, the impact not just on the individual and the cars, but also on the commercial vehicles, also on the for hire vehicles. How would it all work? And how do you, you know, how can we take advantage of the digital world that we live in to be able to make it as, again, as I said, efficient and effective? So, your question about the vote, yeah, yes, sir, we could have a vote, but it's not a vote in saying, yes, we should do congestion pricing, no, we shouldn't. There are certain principles that are within. Uh, the Fix NYC report that I think the board at the MTA uh, should buy into, and that is let's do the proper planning, let's let the legislative and uh, executive branches of government who are involved in um, uh, the, developing the laws that would allow congestion pricing to go in place, let, you know, for help let the MTA board facilitate that process, but not get in the way of it. So you're That's not planning on having a vote? Uh, we will have a vote, but on the principles of the... On the principles, on not the on principles the... On the principles of it. Principles, okay. Because the plan itself is too amorphous to say okay. A or nay. I'm going to end with this because there are a lot of folks that have questions. Um, you said to us the other day, uh, which was, I think, very, very helpful, and I think it's great to have, of course, this level of um, introspection, I would say, that the MTA needs to do a better job at communicating with the public, not just when they're on a stranded train, but generally with the public on how these 
planned improvements and how these capital dollars will actually help uh, make the system better, both the operating dollars and the capital dollars. And, and I would just reiterate to you, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this so you could say it for us and for the public, uh, where the MTA has fallen down in many ways. Most New Yorkers, the six million people that take the subway every day, uh, they, they, they just want to get to work on time. They just want to end up at an appointment on time. They don't want to be stuck in a train. They don't want to be stuck on a subway platform. They don't want to have unreliable service. And they already feel nickeled and dimed in New York City with property taxes and a variety of other issues that they feel like we're being screwed a little bit. So when it comes to the subway system, which is the most egalitarian, quintessential thing about New York City, they need to understand how this plan is actually going to help them. Sure. It can't be conceptual. It can't be, well, we're going to eventually get the modern signal technology 40 years from now through a five-year capital plan. They don't understand that, nor should they. They don't care about that. They want to know, how is this going to affect my day-to-day -day life on a regular basis? What are you going to do to ensure that we can get to work on time, that when we try to get on the subway on the weekends, it's not rerouted in 50 different directions because of the work that's getting done. What needs to happen? And so I think it would be helpful, given that this is a hearing today, the press is here covering it, that you communicate to the public, that our plan is gonna help you in this way. Sure. So let me, let me first state that an overwhelming majority, and many people may disagree with me on this, but the numbers and the facts bear, bear, uh, support my effort. An overwhelming majority of the people get to their destination on time. I want all everybody to get to their destination on time. Um, however, there are going to be certain circumstances where we may have to reroute because of some unfortunate circumstance some that are in our control and some that are not in our control. So I think it's important for us uh, as an organization, instead of having the pre-canned programs that were put in place a decade ago, we're saying, you know, we're being delayed because of a police action. You know what, we ought to state exactly what's actually happening up front, and we've started that process. Um, we also have to do a better job of uh, uh, talking about all the things that we've put online. I mean, you know, it's amazing to me that most people don't realize that they have in their pocket, uh, they have uh, the countdown clocks for every single line in the system in their pocket. You can go on to subway time uh, and be able to find out when the next stop, when the, you know, when the NR, the R train are going to come here on Broadway or the four, five, and six across the street at the Muni building, and you know when the next one and the next three are coming, and take advantage of that. Many, you know, we're not doing a good enough job of marketing that to everyone. We will be coming out with a new, uh, a new app that will allow people pop in your address and it'll give you and where your destination is and it'll give you three different ways in which you can get there on our system both on the subway and on buses and in walking and where to turn and all the rest of that um, the other you know and in, 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 to be able to understand the system better I mean one of the things we did with the new R211s is we actually had a model of the R211s we had it up at the uh, up at, uh, at the west side yards the Hudson Yards um, and a model was up there we advertised it um, and I monitored every day how many people came to see it. A lot, a lot of New Yorkers did, but most members of council never came to look at what the new modern trains look like. I need your help as well. You need to get out there because people will follow what you do. Uh, it's very important. We, we put advertisements out. We had articles in the tabloids as well as in New York Magazine about it. We're at least get, we're able to get pictures up out there. But I think it's important that people get an idea of what the new trains will look like, what features they will have. And this is a train that has a feature that it's going to be five cars in one, the open gangway, which allows you to not having doors in between cars. It'll be five car lengths long, and it's important for people to see it combined with the fact that they have larger doors, which will allow more people to get on and off as you talked about earlier how crowded the train was getting here today. The, nothing is more emblematic of, of the system than the fact that the doors, if the doors were a little bit bigger, um, more people would be able to exit and more people would be able to enter simultaneously. So there, there are all the things we have to do to uh, explain the system. And the other thing that I want to be able to do, because I've noticed this over time, uh, having uh, first taken the subway system in the mid-1950s, my, my feel for the system is uh, I 
I just kind of have a feel for how the system works because I grew up with it. Um, a, a lot more people need to understand how robust our system is, how interoperable it is. You know, if there's a problem on the 4, 5, and 6 and you're coming into Lower Manhattan and you get to 23rd Street, Union Square, there are other opportunities. You don't necessarily, you, you should be able, we need to do a better job of explaining uh, exactly if you need to get to Fulton Station or you need to get to Lower Manhattan, there are multiple ways to get there uh, just to have a better understanding of how robust our system is. Remember, as I, I didn't say this in my testimony, the system was, was actually conceived in the eight, late 1800s. It opened in 1904. Uh, it's quite ancient. Um, and, um, and as part of it, we need to do everything we can to maintain it, but as also, we also have to do a better job of explaining how it operates. We deserve to have a system, and I know you agree with this, that resembles major cities in Asia and in Europe where they have beautiful, reliable systems that have modern day infrastructure. We're a long way from that. In the meantime, I look forward to stabilizing the system with you. And lastly, I would say, if ultimately the city council and this administration decide to participate in the subway action plan uh, in splitting it with the state, I would say that the negotiations that take place beyond the subway action plan, but on other items, uh, that are important to members of this council, whether it be express F train service to South Brooklyn or express bus service from the North Shore of Staten Island or Mid Staten Island or uh, uh, service out in Queens on the 7 train uh, or service into the Bronx uh, for riders that have a long commute into Manhattan every single day who uh, you have council members and elected officials who've been pushing for better options for mm -hmm. their constituents. I really, really hope that as we start to have more earnest discussions about the money that the city would put forward, that we could also talk about the MTA uh, putting together and taking into consideration in a meaningful way that we'll see results uh, on these other issues which aren't directly tied to the subway action plan, mm -hmm. but are tied to what council members hear from their constituents every single day. I want to hand it back over to the chair, and I want to thank you, uh, Chairman and uh, Managing Director, for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and you have my word on what you just said. I'd be more than happy to sit with any members uh, and, and actually go through in, in detail. Buy the Daily News. It's not that expensive. Somebody in the office has it. I read it every, I read it every day. I read it religiously. He's got it. Thanks. Thanks. And he actually points out what I should read. But thanks. Mm. Thanks. I need someone to do that for me. Thanks. Thank you, Speaker. And I would like to acknowledge all the colleagues who are here. Councilmember Levine, Kuh, Ross, Richard, Rosenthal, Brian, and Constantinides. I also would like to thank the staff who work with us to put this hearing together from the finance, Latonia, Regina, and Nathan and Paul, as also Mala, Jonathan, Emily, and of course, Shima, and, and John Basile. Los New Yorkinos están cansados, frustrados, y quieren solución. Eh, we've been dealing with this crisis, you know, for decades, and you have played a major role, especially, you know, bringing your expertise in leadership. Uh, after Sandy, you showed what a leader was to bring the system back on track on time. But I have a few questions. One is, in MTA established that in the proposal for installing the CBTC, 1991 and 97, the plan was uh, to computerize the whole system mm -hmm. by 2017. I assume that that decision can with funding in the capital and expense of the MTA for those years, 91 and 97. It, it did not. Was that the case? Was there a commitment at the state, or it was only like war and dream? Right. It was creating it, it, expectations to New York about like 2017. We will have a computerized signal system completed again by last year. However, well, the only line that we have today is the L line and the plan to upgrade the signal system. 
is 2045. It means I will be 80 years old if we follow the schedule. Of course, I know that you have different view, you have a different vision. What is that we should expect to cut the date of completing the signal system that today is 2045? So we are, uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief because I'm realizing the time and I'm talking too long in each answer, so I'll, I will be uh, cut right to the point. One, that that thing, thing from 1991 uh, that you talked about did not include funding and it directly answered the question. Number two, uh, we are in the process right now. Tomorrow we will be uh, unveiling the results of the genius competition that was put together last uh, uh, June. Um, and uh, part of that is talking about new and different signalization systems. Separately, we've been working on new wireless signalization systems. We believe, and I believe personally, that there are new technologies out there that can be installed quicker and faster, but we're in the proof of concept stage at this point in time in testing it. So once we know what that is, we'll be able to develop a plan that we'll be able to share with you and the public uh, on how quickly we can put in the signal system. Also, uh, the signal system needs to be done in uh, less, you know, quite honestly, the signal system that was put on the L train was put in uh, with the redundancy. The old system is there, the new system is there, the old system's maintained, the new system's maintained. You know, that, that kind of duplication of effort is not necessary. There are other ways to do it faster. We need to do it faster. And here's why. The new signalization system will allow us to have more trains come more frequently. But remember, the cost of that is not just the signalization system. Every single one of our trains are being used. We'll need more cars, and those are even more expensive than the signalization system. So I just want to say, you know, each one of these things trips into another category. And the other part is signalization is not, you know, the modern signalization system, um, as, as you've talked about, is not just how do you change the red lights, the green lights, and the yellow lights that you see on the side of the, of the right-of-way uh, next to the track. What you, what you really have to do is each and every car or train talks to all the other trains, and the computer helps speed them up, slow them down, so that we can do, you know, uh, quite honestly, our, our goal, well, right now on the number seven line, when uh, there are, you know, no other delays, we're getting, uh, we're getting something like 26 trains per hour every two minutes and 30 seconds coming through during rush hour uh, through that. We'd like to get that down to every two minutes. We get many more trains per hour in there. That's the whole point of the signalization. But signalization is, um, is complex, but it also means not just sig signalization, it's gonna need all new cars. But the institution that has a value of $1 trillion, the MTA, decided in 91, put the idea that in 91, repeating 97, there was a vision, the plan, and they understood the need because the signal system, as you have described it here in all the conversation, was not accurate. And we could not continue running the train system with what we had and it's still what we have today. Uh, so when, so are you are saying that, they, when did the NTA start investing, because you say that there was no money dedicated for that plan. So when did the NTA start dedicating funding to upgrade the signal system? So I'll have, I'll have to get back to you when they started the L, but in addition to the L, we've, uh, we've also now got all the hardware on the number seven. We're in the finalization stages of doing the software necessary, and we should see that mid-2018. So the number seven, which goes from Flushing over to the West Side Yards, will be at CBTC. The Queens Boulevard line is, is, in, process, is in, in the budget right now, as is the Culver line, uh, which is F and yeah, FDF line was also in line. So those are in the, uh, already in the budget. Those are already have the planning and some of the implementation has already started. Um, and, and the next capital plan is to lay out all of the other lines necessary, hopefully with new technology that's being developed right now. Okay. Can we expect that a priority in the capital measurement for this coming year and for the next few years, will be focused on maintenance and repair? Yes.
on transparency, how many companies typically bid for major MTA projects, and what is being done to attract more bid from more contractors so that projects can be finished on time right. and with less f money? So, so um, that really, I think it's a capital-related question, the large projects. We, we generally get three to four bidders. We need to get more. We need to do everything we can to encourage uh, more companies to uh, be able to provide bids. Look, the problem exists for the MTA. The problem exists with the School Construction Authority. The problem exists with DEP. We need to collectively together work on making the projects that we work on and the organizations that we run more uh, friendly, user friendly. There are a lot of companies, there are large, large contractors, um, and I can name some of them, that does, won't come in and do business in New York. Bechtel, which is one of the largest contractors in this country, will be more than happy to work on the, on the subway system in Los Angeles, but they don't bid on it here, and I'd like to. I'm gonna do everything I can to encourage more competition because from that we will get better results. It's a problem I recognized, I recognized uh, when I came back. It's a problem that I'm focused on. Why is, how, what, what, what are you, what should we expect under your leadership more. when it comes to, when it, when it comes to, to controlling, trans, bringing more transparency uh, so, to so New I, York, sorry, Chairman, yeah. bringing more transparency for New Yorkers to know how the MTA is spending the taxpayer dollars it, for so as any I said, project. As I said at the Democratic conference earlier this week, um, we have to do a better job of marketing. I encourage everyone here to go to the MTA website, click on transparency, click on every single one of the capital projects is included on there. It shows you on a monthly basis how much has been spent. Are we on schedule? Are we behind schedule? How far are we ahead of schedule? How far are we behind schedule? How much are we spending? How much did we spend in the prior period? Uh, it's, it's there. It's a, it's a robust system, and I encourage everyone to look at it. Um, the, the, uh, and if there's more, and if people have better ideas, I'd be more than happy to uh, be able to lay it out differently, provide that information differently. Uh, we've gone a long way to providing the information that is there. The number of reports that are put out, whether it's by the Citizens Budget Commission or Transportation Alternatives or Mr. Raskin's group, they're all getting information directly from our website. I, you know, it's there. So I understand the need to talk about transparency, but I also want to understand what is it that we're giving already that needs to be expanded. Okay. What about buses? Huh? It, as you know, transportation desert is real in our city, many places, far rock away, Bronze, Queens, Staten Island, and what is the boss action plan that we should expect New Yorker we see happening sure. the, in the street? The bus action plan is going to be different than the subway action plan. The subway action plan really talks about the deteriorating infrastructure uh, that exists within uh, the subway system due to the disinvestment that I've talked about over time. Most of our buses are brand new. Most of our buses are modern. Many of them are environmentally safe and sound. Um, uh, including electric buses, which we're trying out, right, fully electrified buses that we're, we're trying now. And so it's not about the infrastructure. It's about two other things, the routing and the congestion. I agree with you. There are, there are certain parts that we need to evaluate. The demographics of the city of New York are changing quicker than, than ever before in history. People are moving into what used to be warehouse districts and, you know, all types of work is going on. The mayor... Who doesn't like the who? Um, <laughs> in any event, um, threw me for a loop there. Uh, in any event, the, the, so we have to evaluate our routes. We've gone through the routes, the long-term bus routes in Staten Island. We'll be more than happy to work on it. I totally uh, agree with you that we, we need to focus on the changing demographics to be able to mirror image. I also think on our buses and, and clearly willing to work with the city uh, on congestion, not, not just congestion pricing, but you know, I've been to Albany and I agree that the city of New York needs more red light cameras. I think the city of New York needs the ability to enforce the bus lanes. I want to see the buses flowing as quickly as possible. I agree with the folks who were outside before. We should have all-door boarding. I talked about that 
at a board meeting, I think back in October, November, how important it is that with a new uh, payment system that we're putting in place that we have all door boarding. All of those issues have to happen. So I think the mechanics necessary in the, in the, in the bus action plan are gonna be very, very different than the subway action plan. Okay. There's four ideas to raise funding for the MTA. Congestion price, millionary taxes, Dinoj plan, Scott Stringer plan. Both, all those four ideas and proposals on the table can raise $27 billion in the next 10 years for the MTA. As you are open on the congestion price, don't you think that also we should look at the four proposals that we had on the table? I'm, I'm uh, as I said publicly, I'm agnostic to the additional sources of funding. This is a responsibility of the elected officials. I'll be more than happy to testify on each and every one of them, what works, what doesn't work, which ones have better credit worthiness, uh, which, you know, how much should be used for the capital plan, how much should be used for the operating budget, how much can we, you know, the, the state legislature made a decision back in um, 2010 that there would be a fare and toll increase every two years. There's been a lot of pushback to that, but there's been no additional revenues to be able to deal with that. We're on, we're on track right now for another fare and toll increase next year uh, in 2019. Uh, so we need to have a discussion about the, you know, what will the new capital plan look like and how much do we need for the operating budget? Uh, okay. I'd be more than happy to work with any, anybody and everybody. As I said, I'm agnostic when it comes to which plan makes, you know, which, which one works. Because it's a, you know, elected, elected officials have a difficult job. I realize that. You're asking to take money from one area and give it to another area. My job is difficult in that I want to be able to prove to you that I can spend it as effectively and as efficiently as possible. Okay. So, you know, when, when I drive by through the, now the Mario Como Bridge, when the bridge was under construction, I used to tell my daughter, you know, look at this because we don't have that opportunity to see big projects happening sometime in our time. I think that all of us would like to be part of this legacy to transform our transportation system. Mm -hmm. We, I personally also feel that we should discuss how the city should increase the contribution by understanding first that the city is making important contribution already. Second, that the city should know to which particular project those funding will be go, going. And third, should the city has an increase of board member at the MTA? What do you think? Um, I, regarding the last point, as you know, the mayor has four appointees. The governor is required out of uh, his six members to have three additional appointees from the city of New York. Um, you know, again, um, I inherited the legislation that exists. It's legislation that comes through Albany. If you want to propose changing to it, um, you know, talk to your representatives. I think, you know, for my job every day is to make the trains run on time. Um, I, I, you know, how exactly the governance structure works uh, just gets me away from dealing with getting the trains to run on time. So. You know, if you want to change any part of the governance, please talk to your state senator. Please talk to your assembly member. Please talk to the governor. Uh, we are, and we will continue. I believe that this is a time where both the city and the state, we should sit in the room. We should come out a conclusion because this is about 8.5 million New Yorkers. And the impact that we have not only has an effect in our city, but also in the state and the national level. With that, uh, let's start calling the council member. We put in the clock. Can I, can in, I, can I remind in, the chairman for a second? I Because a, an hour and a half is what I, I gave. I'm, I have only 15 minutes left. I will do my very best to shorten this. I was here to, to 11 o'clock because I have another engagement. But maybe I can do to 11.10, but that's about it. And if I need to come back, I'd be more than happy to come back. I want to recognize council member Cabrera. And now we're calling on our members. Uh, because of the time, let's focus, let's put the time on, on two minutes so that we can be able to accomplish our goal. Let's start it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, sir. Laura. Con council member, sir. You know, I sympathize with you. You don't need my sympathy. 
But I do. I need your prayers. But I do sympathy, sympathize with you, I don't and I'm going to tell you why. You are being caught between a fight of two colossus, of two giants, each one trying to beat the other. You are in the middle. And, but the Bible says that you cannot serve two masters. So you have a big problem because as long as these two colossus keep fighting, the resident of the city of New York, the writers, the senior citizen, the one that uses the, the subways and the buses are having a big problem. And they will continue having the problem until those two giants try to get together and put the people first and not their personal and political ambition. Do, saying that, on Thursday, February, February 22nd, the NTA board approved 230 million plan to renovate subway station. I have a problem in my district. Some time ago, some time ago Parchester subway station was renovated, but whoever did the plan, whoever did it, forgot the handicap and forgot the, the wheelchair resident and they don't have an elevator there. Those that money that was approved, are you intending to solve that problem? Two oh. parts to your question. First, uh, I agree with you uh, that you can only serve one master. My master are the riders, period. Uh, because that's, that's what I said uh, to the governor when I got this job uh, and came back to the MTA, it's to serve the riders. Two, um, the, we have a separate part of the uh, uh, capital plan that deals with accessibility for the disabled, both elevators and escalators, separate and distinct from the subway, uh, uh, the, the uh, enhanced station improvements that are going in. Uh, Park Chester was not included in that. No, Park Chester was not included in, in those projects. Uh, that was from, that was in the past, and I, I'll look up and see what happens with that. Um, but um, we have a whole separate um, uh, effort going on right now uh, with a working group that I convened at the board level with staff and the board about how to increase our accessibility, how to increase our uh, ability for disabled New Yorkers to be able to access not part of the system but all of the system. And we're in the process of working on that right now. Thank you. I would like to encourage because I think that we can get into a, a good, I mean, because of the time and limited time, let's go as directly to the question. And Chairman, if it's so, after you, so, I'm sorry. So I can make one more. I would like to say yes, but then we have the other council member that they will not be able to ask a question. So each one is allowed only one question. Ask a question, but not necessarily the answer and can be given or very it, it, it is a shame, and I am going to say that I get up at 5 o'clock this morning, and I was here because I, I was interested in what happened. I have my questions. And it is kind of disrespectful for the, for the chairman to say, oh, I only have uh, an hour and whatever, I gotta go. I mean, we are elected a uh, member of the city, uh, the, the city, city council, elected by our people to respect. I'll be more than willing to come back. Up, and I this is disrespectful. Mm -hmm. uh, so, council member. Thank you, Chair, and appreciate you uh, uh, being helpful here. Uh, just quick question, so thank you for being here, obviously. I wanted to hear a little bit more. Um, so obviously the city sends a lot of money to the MTA, and I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about a lockbox scenario mm -hmm. and how we are going to ensure that if the city is entertaining putting capital dollars in, that that money is going to be spent in New York City, and more importantly, transparency to the council uh, would be uh, something that we would want to hear a little bit more about. Um, 
city ticket, so the city ticket program pilot is coming to Southeast Queens. Councilmember Miller, unfortunately, is sick and could not be here. Uh, but he wanted me to express his sentiments and my sentiments and other elected officials' sentiments on uh, the fact that it's being set up for failure because people are being, for you to gain access to the program, you would have to go to Atlantic Terminal. So did you get the letter the borough president and many of us sent over um, saying that we believe that the pilot should focus in uh, to more people going into Penn Station since many of our residents go there. Um, lastly, um, A-train connectivity to the ferry system. So I know there needs to be some technologies around metro cards being accessible, um, access being accessible from the ferry and the Rockaways. And then lastly, uh, the issue, two last two issues, A-train uh, reliability. As you know, the Rockaways is, is very far from here and reliability has been a, a huge challenge and, um, and obviously handicap accessibility around um, stations in, in Southeast Queens and I'm sure around the city. So those four things as, as quickly as you can touch on those. Sure, uh, uh, regarding, regarding the Freedom Path, which I think was one of the middle questions, um, I have not yet received the letter, though I had the luxury of reading about it in the newspaper, so I have a gist of what was put together. Uh, on that, and we were, we were evaluating uh, the options. It is not set up for failure by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we, we need to determine uh, how it would work. We also need to determine, you know, uh, the, the amount of movement. When we originally talked about the program, we had thought that there would be less trains coming into Penn Station that would allow for more mobility. So we have to look at all that. We have to take it into consideration. So you're but open it, to? I'm open. I'm, I'm absolutely okay. open. Okay. To um, uh, regarding uh, the ferries using the metro card, we've had discussions with EDC about it. EDC does not want to pursue it. You should ask whenever the president of EDC is in front of you, ask him why it doesn't work that way. But because I'm more than happy, just like we. Well, they're saying opposite, so we need to so make sure. Member, we sorry, yes, sir. I, because of timing. Fine. Uh, Councilmember Bramer, followed by Councilmember Yeager. Thank you very much. I'll try and be very quick. Three things. Uh, first, um, uh, I'm glad the council is open uh, to uh, working with uh, everyone on providing more funding. But one question that is persistent among my uh, certainly constituents and people in Queens is uh, how effectively we're managing the money that you do have. Eastside Access, uh, $10 billion project. Uh, I believe you said on the other day, serving 300,000 uh, primarily Long Islanders. Uh, that is way over budget and long over uh, due. Uh, also, CBTC, obviously you're finishing it on the 7 train. Uh, that also, of course, ran over. Um, concerned about uh, how effectively we're spending the money. If we're going to provide more funding, more city dollars, uh, do you have the systems in place uh, to correct what happened to these site access and even with CBTC since you're going to expand it? And thirdly, the L train, its effect on Long Island City, just transporting all the folks on the G train to uh, 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 our neck of the woods, uh, already meeting an overcrowded yeah. 7 train, those are three issues really succinctly. Real, real quickly, uh, regarding east side access and uh, the capital, the CBTC capital programs, um, I agree. We need. We we are in the process with uh, Jana Lieber, the the new head of the capital program, our capital, our, our uh, development officer, uh, finding new and better ways of doing project management. Project management has been abysmal on the capital side. I agree with you and uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, who it's been also been a big issue for her. We need to spend these. I'm a taxpayer too, and we need to do a better job of spending this money. Um, east side access, um, and I, as I mentioned at the committee, more than happy to bring any member of uh, council down to look at what has been done already and what's left to be done down there. Uh, it'll be, um, uh, I think, a great asset for the city of New York, not just Long Island, of what it will be able to do. Uh, and then finally, on the L train in Long Island City, uh, you know, part of what we did in the, um, the summer problem with the Long Island Railroad last year regarding Amtrak is we had. Uh, an array of uh, approaches and uh, uh, different ideas and different ways in which people. We're going to have to, early on with the closure of the uh, L t the tunnel, the Canarsie uh, line tunnel, uh, be able to figure out, give people alternatives. So we're going to have to figure out what's the, what works and what doesn't work. We won't know until it actually gets implemented. 
Um, but uh, I understand. I mean, I'd like to get that project started and over with as quickly as possible so we can get back to normal. Thank you. Councilmember Yeager, followed by Councilmember Lander and Dodge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm here for about 67 days uh, as a young aide to a council member in this chamber in the 90s and to a borough president. I never anticipated uh, sitting across from Joe Loda and asking him questions. Uh, so welcome back to the chamber that you own far more than I do. Um, my question involves value capture. Uh, I know you, you're familiar with it and uh, you have uh, an incredible uh, history and legacy here in the city of public service. Uh, you've run far more things than the MTA. Um, my question is, uh, you know, and, and for those who, who may not be aware, but I know you're aware very quickly, uh, the, the value capture would allow people to, would allow the MTA, an unelected body, to create a sub-district uh, of approximately a mile, or they're up to a mile around an improvement, and uh, essentially tax based on that, 75% of the revenue going to the MTA, 25% going to the city, um, and with no expiration date. Uh, so it, continue, it can continue, in theory, pat, long past when the value is recaptured. Um, when you were here at City Hall, I think if somebody proposed something like that and an unelected body imposing a tax on the people of New York City, I don't think you would uh, stand for it. I think you'd be screaming from the rooftops, Mr. Chair. It's, that's your style, and, and I like it very much um, because that's, uh, that's what we need. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a taxation without representation in, in, the, in the very essence of what it is. Uh, I'd like you to address that, and I understand you, you've testified that you're agnostic about where the revenue comes from because your current role is as a fiduciary of the MTA to bring in what you can and spend it wisely. But uh, ultimately, you're a New Yorker, you're a New York City resident, uh, you will be paying for it in some way. Um, particularly where you live. And one quick question that you can tag on to the end. You uh, testified that close to one billion of the 16 billion comes from New York City. Does that include tax revenue, dedicated revenue sources, or is that s strictly the money that we write a check from here in the city of New York to the MTA? And does that also include fair revenue? And if not, can you add those numbers and give us that uh, money, that, that number and what percentage it relates to the $16 billion? Thank right. you, Mr. Chair. The one, billion, the one billion dollar number I mentioned is money that comes directly from the budget that you get to vote on. All of the other things that you've talked about, I don't have with me, but we, I'll ask the staff member to be able to provide it to your office. Uh, Council member, um, the, the value capture proposal does not put on an additional tax. There's a lot of misinformation about it, and I'm working with the legislature right now to, as they're developing their budget, uh, to discuss how there would be more city involvement, how there would be more of a partnership with the city on how value capture or incre increment financing would work. Let me just briefly, and I'll try to do this as quickly as possible, and do this in a separate meeting on how value capture would work, but essentially, uh, there's current, you know, the, it, when, in, when you, um, this has been done, by the way, not in, in Chicago and Los Angeles, it's been done all over. And so basically the city determines what the tax rate is. If the value of the area goes up above what it is today, directly related because of an investment, similar to what uh, happened with, the lit, with what Council and Mayor Bloomberg did regarding the West Side Yards, he was able to dedicate a piece of that to pay off the debt. That's exactly what uh, this tax increment financing would do. If there's any incremental revenue above what's currently, you know, expected now and the city has a four-year plan and that four-year plan has growth rate within the plan, so it's not a constant or stagnant number, any amount above that is to be shared. I don't want to get into a discussion about the percentage because I, I think that's going to, that, let's wait for the new legislation to come forward. That said, um, you know, it's a, it's a function of, you know, and I also agree it needs to be tighter than a mile this way or that way. We need to, it needs to be more constrained. Uh, but, the, but the function is it's been a traditional financing structure in 48 out of the 50 states and all over Europe, uh, as well as in Asia, uh, and it's one worth having here. And I think but, but it, it but requires- But you testified yourself in your exact words where this is sorry, responsibility member, sorry, of elected officials. Sorry, member, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry, it's because of the other let, members. Let me let the chair Excuse conclude. me, council member, and the and I'll, let, I'll let the chair conclude, I'm done. I, I, uh, I did, did say that uh, it requires the elected officials, and elected officials would put together the program, and I believe that, you know, each and every project uh, would be a function of uh, folks that have been uh, elected at the state and elected at the city and how they come to it on a project-by-project -project basis. Sorry. I apologize to my colleagues dealing with the pressure to be sure that as many of us. 
Councilmember Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for being here last year. As the you were not yet in leadership, but the crisis was beginning to come in view. What we got from the MTA at this preliminary budget hearing were two junior staff who answered none of our questions, and the chair and my and Chair Ferreras's heads were about to explode. So I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the leadership you're providing so far. I want to focus again on signals. Am I correct that the number one cause of subway rider delays are signal failures? Yes. Um, that's, it looks that way for sure from the major subway incidents by cause chart on the dashboard, but I will point out the dashboard does not currently track all signal failures. It only collects the major ones. That's why we launched signalfail.com, which we're building out from your Twitter feed. Would you commit to put all subway signal failures on the MTA dashboard so all riders could see them? I think it needs to be broken down as to what causes the signal failure, because again, it's that would be fine. But right now, you're only I'll collecting. Look, I'll look into it. You yeah, only I'm put the ones that cause major delays on, which are an average of about 24 a week. Right. There's about 38 a week, according to our records. So if you would look into that, the dashboard ought to collect all information about signal failures. It doesn't currently. You Check think out only signal. Only 38 a week. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> since we launched it in November, 13 million riders have been delayed by those average of 38 a week signal failures. So they're adding up. But the public shouldn't be able to get more information from our I'll, website I'll than from it. your That's website. So I'd ask you to it. fix it. And I guess here's where I would go. Those 13 million riders delayed. The subway action plan has added some money to repair the old signals. But so far, under your leadership, we can debate whether we subtracted. But we sure haven't added anything to modernize the system. Uh, I'll go with CBC's budget analysis. On our current path, it's going to take us 50 years. London and Paris are way ahead of us. Um, now, I appreciate that you're testing the ultra-wide band radio technology in a top-secret test that I read about in the Daily News, so good reason to, to buy it, as the, as the speaker said. I appreciate the genius grant that we're doing proof of concept, but like someday I'm going to have a jet backpack I can get around with. I can't wait till proof of concept of jet backpacks, and I fear that's going to be sooner than when the signal system is modernized. If you're asking for more money, if you want congestion pricing, which I do, you've got to come to us with a comprehensive program to fix the Thank signals you, in Council 15 Member. years and not 50 years. I agree. I, I totally agree. And, and uh, we will be doing it. But, uh, you know, as I said before, we're putting it, uh, we're almost finished with the uh, number seven train. And, and then the Queens Boulevard line is partially done already. We'll continue with it. It'll happen much faster. It has to happen faster. However, uh, one thing I, I do want to highlight. And, and, and people to focus on, and when they make these comparisons to place like, places like Paris, there's no interoperability in Paris. There's one, there are lines, goes from one line, from point A to point B. They don't intersect, they don't change like the F train and, or the various different trains that we have here that are interoperable. That doesn't exist there. And for the signal system, it is a lot more complex because the signals are not just what's on the side of the road. Each and every one of the trains, each and every one of the cars has to be adapted for I, I don't doubt it's hard. When can we expect a Sorry, sorry. When can we Thank expect you. a comprehensive plan? Council Member Deutsch, later this year. Levine, La I'm sorry, I just couldn't later, hear you. Later this year, we'll have a better idea of where we stand on ultra wideband. <coughs> Thank you. Council Member Deutsch. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm actually not going to expect any answers out of respect of my, to my colleagues. But the first question, I'm going to go out of order, because um, my first question is not for someone in the panel. My first question is for one of my colleagues here. I want to know what a colossus is. That is a Greek name for a per person or a thing of a enormous Okay, thank Sta uh, status of uh, importance or ability. Thank you, gracias. Okay. So I, now my next question is um, for, um, for Mr. Loda. So I've noticed that uh, the MTA over the last four years has not been as forthcoming as they have been, and I appreciate over the last two weeks you've been uh, really a great partner coming to the council, speaking at the, at the conference, coming, being here today. So we appreciate that. Um, so we also um, we understand that um, the MTA is asking the city for 400, over $400 million. So that's a lot of money. We all know that. And we have 51 council districts uh, throughout our city. So the question is, is also what's going to happen? What, what is the MTA going to do to tackle some of those issues that council members had over the last four years that, you know, if we do consider about giving $418 million to take care of those issues that affect all our districts, because if 
let's say I agree on $418 million and the $418 does not come into my district, then I have a problem with that. So how are we going to make sure that it's spread out? We all understand where the money and what the money is being used for and how it's going to benefit all our districts. That's, that's my first thing. Uh, second thing I wanted to mention is that we mentioned congestion pricing. So I just want to bring up that we have, uh, I believe, three HOV lanes throughout our city. Uh, Manhattan Bridge, if you use the left lane of the upper roadway inbound to Manhattan. The second one, Long Island Expressway into Queens to the Midtown Tunnel. And the third one, Brooklyn Valley Tunnel onto the Gowanus Expressway. So many times when you're driving on these roadways, the, um, the HOV lanes are completely empty because uh, you need three people or more. So if we make a charge for, let's say, throwing out a number, $20, if anyone, three people or less, want to use the HOV lanes, it will ha it will, um, two things will happen. One, you'll get revenue, city and state, for those paying for the HOV lanes. And number two, it will reduce congestion on those highways and those thoroughfares. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member, Council Member uh, Levine, followed by Council Member Ku. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Chairman Loda, thank you for being here. Uh, the funding needs of your agency are so severe that we need every level of government chipping in, uh, state for sure, federal, and city as well. I do want to, however, correct the misimpression that upstate New Yorkers are somehow subsidizing the system. Um, yes, we put in a billion or more in direct money out of city coffers, but uh, as Councilmember Yeager pointed out, uh, many of the taxes that are considered state funding are paid by, by us, the mortgage transfer tax, the, the business petroleum tax, uh, and others. Uh, then there's what we pay at the fare box. But even the money coming out of the state fund, I would argue, is mostly paid by people in the five boroughs. We send $8 billion more per year to Albany than we get back. Um, New York City is the economic engine of this state. Uh, the transit system is, is the lifeblood of that economy, so uh, it only makes sense uh, that we have robust state and, and other public investment in this system. Uh, in, in my remaining time, I do want to focus my questions on an issue that you and I have spoken about, which I know you care a lot about, which is the buses, uh, New York City's other transit crisis, um, and the, the wonderful technological solution of allowing buses to pass through intersections uh, with the green light through transit signal priority. Now, a lot of that is on us because DOT controls the streets and the signals, but we do need software on the buses. Can you tell me of the 5,800 buses in your system, how many have the software upgrades for transit signal priority? We currently have um, traffic signal prioritization along seven of our, our existing bus routes. We are, of course, looking to increase that um, as well, working with DOT very closely. In terms of the number of our buses, um, over the next several years, 5,700 of our buses will be able to support the new TSP software, and we are accelerating the addition of that, that uh, software implementation. Do you know what the number is today? I'll get the specific number for you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council Member Ku. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I have a hundred questions to ask, but I'm going to ask three today. Yeah, the first one is, as, as Chairman of the MTA, your job is to, uh, uh, to provide safe, reliable, and efficient public transportation for our citizens at a modest cost. So uh, my suggestion, number, my question number one is, uh, when you're going to build those uh, platform doors? Because every time when we have somebody queue on, uh, on the track, and the next day, the, 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 the new day news, the post will say, oh, no, we, when, we, when, when are we going to build those doors? No, the gate. Uh, and every year, like, a couple hundred people die from it, uh, either by suicide or by pushing, uh, uh, crazy people push passengers uh, to the tracks. And I get apprehended when I ride the subway at nighttime. I, I always walk, watch around, make sure there's no crazy people around me. You know? So the second question is, um, we want you to stop building monumental subway stations, like the, the $4 billion Oculus you know, near uh, World Trade Center. It's a waste of money. I mean, it looks good. It's a monument. MTA's job is to build efficient and, uh, 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 train stations, not museums. No? 
Why you spend $4 billion? Even the Fulton Square, the Fulton Station around here is, is a waste of time and space. Such a huge dome and no use. Now, your job is to bring in more revenues from the space. We can use it for commercial, for all this other stuff, uh, digital advertising, but MTA is not doing those. So those are three questions. Platform doors, uh, stop those monumental stations, and then bring in more revenue from the stations, either digital or space-wise. So, uh, so, and um, one um, where, you know, I, I know of no monumental stations that are under development under my watch, so I, I fully understand your feelings about Fulton. Uh, I, I understand that. Uh, we, we have expanded and we are expanding our di additional revenues coming into the system digitally, taking advantage of the fact that we've put now Wi-Fi pretty much out the system, the ability to do digital uh, is there. Regarding platform doors, platform doors are going to be, uh, we're evaluating it, we're testing it now. Uh, not the easiest thing to do because, as I you know, as mentioned earlier, many, if you think about some of the stations, especially down here, that were built 115 years ago, it wasn't expected. We already have narrow platforms. It'll make the platforms even narrow, narrower. But as we look to new stations, we can look to doing that, especially with the expansion of CBTC. We will be doing the experiment uh, as we sh when we close down the L as to what we will do with the with those doors. If you can okay. build doors, Sorry, you can build gates, you know, like, like the, the amusement park gates, that just uh, like five feet tall, then people won't push people to the to the traps. Yes, sir. Thank you. There's a barrier there. Just have to make sure all the trains stop where the doors open up. Not the easiest thing in the world to do since they're driven by you. Do it. Thank you. Great. I'll stay. Thank you. I'll stay. But <laughs> Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you so much, Chair Rodriguez. Thank you for staying, Chair Loda. Uh, two quick questions. Um, both are in the spirit of bringing in more elevators mm -hmm. uh, for those who can't use the stairs. So the first one has to do with design and construction methods. Um, given the outsized costs of phase one of the Second Avenue subway, Will, what will the MTA do specifically to bring down costs of phase two? Would you consider uh, cut and cover station construction, uh, for instance, or other construction methodology changes? And secondly, as has to do with procurement, you've talked about uh, just now, the existing transparency mechanisms that are in place. But I think that it's clear that very important gaps remain. For example, why does the MTA sign non-disclosure bid agreements with its contractors? So um, we are looking at other methodologies. Part of the Second Avenue subway will be part cut and cover and part uh, uh, into the ground, you know, it's already been built. Portions of it have been built. Uh, when you and I were children and Lindsay was the mayor, part they had the actual tunnels being built. We're going to connect to those tunnels that are already in the ground uh, for the extension of the, of the Second Avenue subway. Um, and uh, I'll get back to you uh, on the non disclosure. It's the first time I've ever heard that. Do you want me to jump in? Sure. So quickly, among the things that we're taking a hard look at, the chairman has asked us to look at how we do procurement and cost containment in these large projects. Can we minimize our back of house space? Can we use design build contract packages? Can we package the work differently? Can we eliminate customization of systems? Can we reduce the mechanical costs? All of that contributes to cost efficiency. I'd love to meet with you to hear more about the specific Great. steps that you're taking. Great especially to get more bidders on yeah. projects. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chairman Lord, I think one of the things we spoke about in conference was there's a real crisis of confidence where I feel New Yorkers just don't trust the MTA right now, don't trust them to get them where they've got to go, um, and I think that trickles down to electeds as well. So if the city were to put in the $418 million and which has been said would be a one-shot deal. How do we know, or, or can you tell us, um, that you wouldn't come back for personnel changes and stuff like that for more money? 
Um, it seems you know the the state of the state of good repair has been sort of elusive. So if we do put yeah, the 418 I, I, forward, so so um, the subway action plan is a unique uh, jumpstart program given the years of disinvestment. Um, but uh, the, the the construct of the MTA and its relationship with the city and its relationship with the state is probably best defined by the agreement in 2010 that we're going to be coming back to the city and the state every two years for a fare and toll increase, for other forms of revenue. So I can't make that commitment, but I can make a commitment that what I put together in, in the subway action plan is a jumpstart surge to get the system into a better state of reliability. I came back because I agree with you. There is a level of credibility problem at the MTA. Uh, my, my respect for the organization, my respect for what it needs to do is what's brought me back. Um, I, wanna, I wanna see it through uh, to be able to make sure that that level of credibility. Now, I'll be honest with you, um, the credibility in the 1950s, uh, you know, I was born in 1954, my first experience of running away from home when I was four years old in 1958, uh, using the subway system. There was a credibility crisis back then, too. So I'm not telling you we're not going to have it. You know, it's part of being a New Yorker. We have to rail against something. Um, and the reality is, but I will do my best not to make it the number one issue and, and of one of credibility, because we need it to get to work. We need it to get to the doctor's office. We, our children need to get it to school. We need it 24-7, 365, something I didn't say in my testimony, but I can't say enough of. The only subway system in the world open 365 days a year, every single day of the year. It's extraordinary, but it also has provided uh, for a problem in making sure the repairs happen. As you know, uh, even in your district, you know, on the weekends we're getting, you know, more and more shut down because of the failure to keep up. And, you know, I'm doing my best to get everything back so that we can have a little bit more normalcy. Thank you. Council Member Constantinide, followed by Council Member Cabrera. Thank you, Chair Loder, for being here. I'm going to talk very quickly so we can get all the questions. And uh, enhanced station initiatives. You are spending $150 million in Western Queens uh, to renovate four stations. Uh, the questions I have are, how are the ESI packages chosen and prioritized? Uh, why wasn't ADA programs such as elevators added to those stations? We're doing a complete redesign. You're leaving out uh, our seniors, our, our disabled community, and our parents with strollers from being able to access the system. Uh, the, what is our plan for citywide accessibility? And lastly, you know, closing these stations, I have a press release. I want to know how much uh, is actually for needed repairs and how much is for aesthetics. Um, being honest, I have a press release here that talks about cleaner and brighter stations that will be easier to navigate and, and a modern look and feel. And it has a list of 30 stations that were announced as part of this ESI program um, to Im Im improve the travel experience for millions of, wor of residents. But without signals, without track improvements, um, having it uh, being cleaner and brighter does not get us where we need to go, but we're closing stations for eight months at a time in Western Queens. Our businesses are hurting, our communities can't get where they need to go on time, and frankly, we're frustrated. So the, the, biggest, issue, the biggest issue we have with the uh, enhanced station initiative is nothing to do with cosmetics. It's nothing to do with... Then why was it in the press release highlighted? That's the first thing they talk about in the press release for that event. The first thing that I talk about whenever I talk about is structural. If I can ask the sergeant at arms to please uh, hand this to the council member. These are pictures of the stations in your district that you think do not need to be repaired. The work that's being done in ESI is to take, get rid of the rot and the, and the, and the amount of uh, uh, disrepair that's been in there. These state, they, no, they're, they're all separate. They're all for the council member. Sergeant, they're all for him. They're all same for his stations. These are the stations. The first and foremost thing that the Enhanced Station Initiative does is it deals with the leakage problem and the rot in the infrastructure. While we're in there to shut down those stations, we're also happening to change the lights and paint them and all the rest of it. If it's your preference that we just put it back to the way it was and not have the lights, fine. But the fact of the matter is I still need to shut them down because they're in such a state of disrepair your constituents deserve to make sure that every day that they go onto those platforms that they are safe. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I want my constituents to be safe. I want the trains to run as well. 
I can do more than one thing at a time. I can, you know, it's a large organization. We can run the trains on time and we can rebuild the stations and we can expand the system and we can do lots of things. You know, doing, the idea that you can only do one thing at a time well, I think doesn't, doesn't speak, uh, well, I, I find it absolutely amazing. We can do, we, the government, uh, whether it's the city, the state, the authority, together, we can do more than one thing at a time. Thank you. Councilman Cabrera. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, New York City uh, pays 900 million direct annual subsidies to MTA and 900 million in in-kind contributions. New York State claims to pay 300 million per year, but 90% of that is merely appropriating dedicated taxes and fees. Do you think that should qualify as state contributions since uh, you're asking New York City to foot half of the bill. And my second question for the second time here is uh, in my district, uh, the starts, uh, the number of four train, uh, uh, Council Member Vanessa Gibson, and from 165th to Fordham Row, yep. we don't have a ADA accessible elevator. Uh, when do you foresee that that will take place? Because we're in desperate, desperate need. In light of the fact that we have a recently... So let, me, let me schedule a time to meet with you as someone from my staff to meet with you to go over the timing of the elevators. We've got 25 in the current capital plan. We're in the process of developing an even larger plan to be able to look at this, the exact stations on the, on the, the IRT up into the Bronx. I really appreciate it. Thank and you. regarding the first question... About the got, state funding and all that yes. stuff. I, I'm sorry, but I, I wasn't fully able to follow it, but uh, the question was why? Should, yeah, should we pay half of the bill uh, in light of the numbers that I just gave you? You think well, we should qualify right. that I as mean, a state con uh, contribution? As I said, it was a jumpstart program. It's a program to provide a surge. Uh, I was looking for some form of equity to be able to begin discussions. 50-50 um, was, was, I thought, a great place to start. I'd like to have those discussions. And, and thank you for the opportunity to sit together regarding thank the you. elevator. It means Very a much. lot. Thank you so much. You. Chairman, to close, I just have two questions. One is, uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate the work that Riders Alliance and the whole coalition is doing to improve buses in our city. But one concern that especially New Yorkers, and I know that you understand it too, mm -hmm. Uh, our challenge is to make our train station more accessible. Sure. It's not only for a senior population today, but also that's what we're going with if we are so lucky, you know, to live long. So what is your vision on taking most of our train stations to be accessible? Thank you. Yep. So in addition to the nearly billion dollar investment that's in the current capital program, the chairman has asked us to do a couple of things and we have a board working group working on this right now. How can we build elevators less expensively? How can we make this easier to do in a community? And how can we work with the advocacy communities of our disabled riders to be able to see where we should be making these investments? And how can we communicate better about the existing elevators and um, accessible stations that we have? Those are the charges that we're working on right now. Great. And, and the last one is about, and as you know, like I'm going through a rezoning in Inwood, and definitely we need to improve transportation. But as a community board, we'll be voting the yes or no, that we put a lot of conditions. So condition is all, always important. So for me, I'm at a moment, and I know that many of my colleagues are, which is, yes, we will, we're ready to advocate for the city to increase contribution. But the question is about details, the condition, all the things that we want. One of them for me is related to the New York City veto power on capital. Like, don't you think that it makes sense that that power would be line by line instead of just being uh, for the whole capital plan? I, I have to read the legislation that, that was put in place to, to do that. I, I don't know what it says. So I have to look at that to be able to properly answer your okay. question. Because but I, that's my end. I believe that, you know, New York City make, and all of us, we are New Yorkers, so we make important contribution. It's not only what we take from our budget, but they're different on the way. And as I said before, I personally feel, and I know that it's not on 
your control. There's all the players. I hope to see an increase in oh, New, uh, New York City, and, uh, the city and the mayor, in this case, the council should have seat at the board, but also when it comes to the veto power, I would like to see that veto power to be line by line instead of be voting for the whole one. But with that, I would like to thank you for being here and the whole team. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the members. Um, again, any issues, any questions, call my office, call my call anybody on the government affairs staff at the MTA. We will be more than happy to sit with you, meet with you, talk about capital and all the rest of it. Thank, Thank you very much. And we also welcome, uh, even though he's not here, Andy Byford, but I know that he took the train to go and meet with us at the district's office. I know that it's a great access that we had to lead the New York City Transit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize Councilmember Gibson, and I'm calling members of the public, Jackie Cohen, Stephanie Burgos Veras, Matt Tomich, and Mario Galberi. Galber. Sorry. <laughs> Those names from the public, if you are here, please come and sit. Mario Galbert, Matt, Stephanie, and Jackie Cohen. Because of the time limit, you have one minute to do the summary, and then you have any testimony, give it to us. There's another hearing happening at 12 here, too. Okay. All right, we will make this as brief as possible. <laughs> um, so my name is Jackie Cohen. I'm the campaign coordinator for the Strap Hangers campaign. I'm joined by my colleague Stephanie Burgos Veras, senior organizer at the. Rogers I put Alliance. the clock on two minutes, okay? Thank you. <laughs> um, so New York subway system is in crisis today. The council heard a request from the MTA chair Loda for the city to contribute to the MTA's $800 million subway action plan. The subway action plan is a set of short-term fixes designed to enhance maintenance and stabilize a faltering system. When New Yorkers so sorely need a functioning subway, Chair Loda's request for subway action plan money is something of a red herring. Before having a conversation about appropriate city contribution, um, Governor Cuomo, who controls the MTA and state budget process, should lay out and fund a credible plan to modernize our transit system. The city doesn't control the subway, but it can make a huge difference in improving public transit, particularly by focusing on bus service. New York City is home to the largest, public, uh, largest bus system in the country, providing more trips on average each day than LA, Chicago, and Philadelphia combined. Bus service is a vital mode of transportation for 2.5 million New Yorkers, many of whom are low income, live in outer boroughs without proximity to rapid transit, and don't have access to other modes of transportation. Additionally, New York City's entire bus fleet is ADA compliant, unlike its subway system, which is largely inaccessible for riders with disabilities. Bus service provides a critical link for these New Yorkers without subway access to get jobs, education, health services, and new opportunities. Yet, this, despite the immense need for well-functioning bus service, New York's New York City's buses are failing. This February, our coalition released average speed and reliability report cards that graded 75% of the 246 local bus routes in our city as Ds or, or, Ds or Fs. Bus speeds and bunching have noticeably worsened over the past year alone. Poor service has resulted in riders abandoning bus service altogether. In 2017, bus ridership experienced the worst single year drop in the past 15 years. Fortunately, poor bus service doesn't have to be the norm, and with that, I turn to my colleague Stephanie, who will discuss solutions that the city can take to turn around bus service. Great. Thank you so much, Jackie. I'll take those 10 seconds as well. <laughs> um, so there are many, uh, there's a, a myriad of solutions that the city can take to turn around our bus service and make it a viable transportation option for all of New Yorkers. And our coalition, which is the Bus Turnaround Coalition, um, has aligned three short-term solutions that the city and Mayor de Blasio and the council here can, should, be take, should take in 2018 to provide faster and more reliable um, and better service for our riders. And some of those solutions include Installing more enforced bus lanes. Um, the use of dedicated lanes allows buses to travel faster and more efficiently on our city's most congested streets. And the city should install bus lanes on the 10 local bus routes that the Bus Around Coalition has identified as priorities, um, which are in your packets. I mean, you can see those 10 highlighted. Um, and not only just putting on bus lanes, but we need effective enforcements um, that are critical to ensure that the success of bus lanes um, can be felt by riders. 
NYPD and DOT should work together to enforce our, la our lanes and then use quick curb traffic barriers, bus lane enforcement cameras, and strategic patrols. Another thing that they should be doing um, is expediting the rollout of transit signal priority. And optimizing our tra traffic signals with transit signal priority allows buses to keep to schedule by reducing the amount of time that they spend at red lights. And we're asking that the city should accelerate the rollout of transit signal priority to 60 routes by 2020, not, uh, tw uh, what is it, 15 by 2020. And the third thing that we're asking the city to do is to expand the number of of countdown clocks with real-time passenger information to one of to a thousand busiest uh, stops by 2020. Bus riders are often left in the dark while they're waiting for their bus. They have no idea when it's going to come. Um, Sometimes they wait up to 40 minutes, and having information at the bus stop, um, like uh, bus maps, route information, and count-on clocks uh, will make the bus easier and more intuitive for riders, and it helps provide an all-around better travel experience. Um, and I know as New York City continues to grow, we need to expand our bus service um, for better commute. And so uh, the last thing I have to say, it's time for New York City to envision its bus system and provide riders with fast, reliable, and accessible service that they need. Thank you. Thank you. And as the next speaker will speak, I would also, I also would like to ask Sherlock Bender, Bender from the Transit Worker Union to also to join, join us here on the table, as also Matt Hersher from the AARP. Please join the table now. It's better turn on. I too will be speaking about buses. I'm Matt Tomek, the president of Energy Vision, a New York City-based environmental research group with decades of experience and expertise in alternative fuels, especially for heavy-duty vehicles. Four years ago, the city committed to reducing its greenhouse gas emissions, including from transportation, 40% by 2030, 80% by 2050. Uh, we're also committed to having the cleanest air of any major city over that same time frame but the continued purchase of diesel buses will not get us there. Fortunately, there are options that, that exist. The MTA has successfully operated over 800 natural gas buses for years. The technology is proven commercial, and in fact, 20% of all refuse, or transit buses in the country are running on natural gas today. Better yet, there are new natural gas buses equipped with advanced near-zero emission engines that would provide even better results the new engine is certified by the Air Resources Board of California as well as the US EPA. It cuts emissions of health-threatening particulates and knocks 90% below the most stringent standards. In addition to these new engines, the city also has the opportunity to use a new fuel with more advantages than conventional natural gas. That fuel is biomethane, biomethane also called renewable natural gas or RNG. It's made by collecting and purifying methane-rich biogases emitted by organics, such as food and municipal waste uh, and wastewater, which there's plenty of in New York City. Some of the benefits of this fuel, being a renewable resource, it requires no drilling. It's clean burning as conventional gas can be used in the same infrastructure, which means the 800 buses today running can use it with minimal changes to operations. There is a lot of this fuel available. It's available on the market today. It's running in 20,000 buses and trucks across the U.S. LA Metro just purchased 295 in parallel with its pilot of 95 electric buses. And Santa Monica's Big Blue Bus, along with several other municipal fleets, are experimenting and deploying this fuel. So in the foreseeable future, the city's organics, which the sanitation department is working hard to collect, could be utilized to produce local, homegrown, ultra-low carbon fuel for our buses and truck fleets. And the existing infrastructure, including MTA's Spring Creek Depot, is already using CNG buses. So for all those reasons, we encourage the Transportation Committee to urge the MTA to pursue zero and near-zero emission technology, especially biomethane and near-zero engines, during the L-Train shutdown and beyond. I appreciate the opportunity and would take any questions. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, for everyone, for the Transportation F Committee for hearing me. I'm sorry my member got caught up um, actually on the trains. Um, 
testifying on behalf in a very little way. Um, so I wanted to speak on behalf of him who, he's a division chair for the Signals and Line Maintenance Division of the MTA. Um, they represent 78,000 members in the Line Equipment, Equipment Signal Division and are responsible for maintaining the upkeep and the infrastructure of the New York City subway system specifically handling the lighting, signals, and other line equipment throughout the subway. Um, much ado has been made about the system's crumbling infrastructure following high-profile major derailments that left strap hangers delayed for hours last year. And while New York City has the most expansive public transportation system in the world, unfortunately it has the worst on-time performance of any rapid transit system in the world. That is unfortunate and we are experiencing the effects of deteriorate, the deteriorating system that was caused by decades of neglect, particularly the diversion of necessary funds from the budget. And while we are happy that transportation funding is being seen as more of a priority, we are asking for all sides to step up and address the crisis we have, we have at hand. We are asking city, the city to fulfill its half of the MTA Emergency Response Action Plan, also known as the Subway Action Plan, which amounts to $428 million of the um, $836 million. And um, I'll just fast forward some, some of it, but although the demand for both the services have gone up, causing the expenses to increase, the MTA has continued to pay without any reimbursement to the city. And this is in reference to the fact that we, um, the MTA subsidizes both student transportation and accessorized, unlike Nassau or Suffolk County. And so I feel that the city is kind of, um, how would you say they're they're they can't have it both ways, right? They the the NTA has been subsidizing services that other counties don't, and so it's unfair for them to abrogate their share and their responsibility of the subway system. So I didn't do as well as my member, but I wanted to put that on record. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. My name is Matt Kirshner, and I'm a graduate policy intern at AARP, currently working towards a Master's of Public Administration degree at Columbia University. On behalf of our 800,000 members, aged 50 and older in New York City, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the topic. Uh, New York City's population is aging. Nearly one-third of residents in the five boroughs is over the age of 50, and that group is expected to grow by nearly 20% by 2040. The growth for the 65 plus age group is projected to be even more dramatic with a whopping 40% increase. And our city is not just aging, we are becoming more diverse. African Americans, Blacks, Hispanics, Latinos, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders account for 62% of New York City residents 50 plus, and half of all of those 65 plus living here were born in a foreign country. We know from our recent report, Disrupting Racial and Ethnic Disparities, Solutions for New Yorkers Age 50 Plus, developed in partnership with the New York Urban League, NAACP, Hispanic Federation, and Asian American Federation, that people of color over the age of 50 experience stark disparities in the areas of health, economic security, and the ability to live and remain in their communities. All this means we must make meeting the needs of older New Yorkers a bigger priority. We're grateful to the increase and baseline funding increases made to the DIFTA budget last year, but aging is not just a DIFTA issue. That is why we are here today, along with some of our 800,000 New York City members, and that is why we plan to attend budget hearings for a host of agencies. It's time for the needs of New Yorkers to be addressed across city government. After all, meeting the needs of aging residents and helping them to stay in their neighborhoods is critical to retaining their tremendous economic, social, cultural, and family contribution. It's also the right thing to do. One of the keys to helping our older neighbors continue to live in their neighborhoods, the neighborhoods they call home, is having good, reliable, accessible transportation. And we have a long way to go. AARP's Livability Index found that in low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color, accessible public transportation is inadequate or lacking. For aging New Yorkers to be able to get to doctor's appointments, to work, or to go grocery shopping, they need improved transportation options. That means more elevators and escalators at subway stations, as well as more reliable buses. But we also need to make other improvements, which will hopefully be addressed throughout the day today. According to the city's latest update on the age-friendly NYC, New Commitments for City for All Ages initiative, the plan was to expand transportation options through a pilot program that gives seniors a $1,000 a year credit for car service. Did the pilot launch? And how is the city tracking the pilot's success? 
The city also planned to expand dispatch wheelchair accessible taxi service across the five boroughs. Has that happened? Is it helping wheelchair bound residents ages 50 plus? And our recent disparities report found that changes are needed at the street level. Neighborhoods of color have more pedestrian accidents, accidents due to unsafe street crossings. Those crossings need to be addressed beyond what Vision Zero is already doing. And other streetscape improvements, including curb cuts, pedestrian islands, and pedestrian islands need to be made to make the streets safer for aging residents. The bottom line is that we hope that all the discussion that will happen here today and at all budget hearings will consider the needs of aging New Yorkers. Let's disrupt aging together and help ensure all New Yorkers can age safely and happily in the city they love. Thank you. I think that my colleague have you. I recognize a Councilmember Gibson. A, a Councilmember Cabrera has a question. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for ARP. I'm actually a member, and so I do care uh, about our seniors and uh, the accessibility problems that, that we do have, and uh, looking in forward through the rezoning in Jerome Avenue, we were able to address a lot of these issues, so, um, but that's just a small piece of the city, so uh, please keep advocating. I had a question regarding uh, the criteria. You mentioned that 75% of a lo local bus routes out of the 246 uh, w receive a letter grade of D and F. Uh, if you could share what was the criteria and the delays, uh, are, are these delays being caused because of Traffic, I know in the Bronx, traffic is just becoming horrendous. Uh, and I see the bus drivers doing their best. I even saw one jump the sidewalk just this week because I could see he was, he was being blocked and he was just such in a hurry to get moving because I know they're under pressure on the, because of the supervisors uh, telling them you gotta get there on time. And the last question is regarding, uh, have you looked at new technology, for example, from Tesla, who now they have these awesome trucks, powerful trucks, and now are run on an electric power. So we issued our grades. Uh, the analysis was done by our colleagues at Transit Center, and we can send your office the, the report cards themselves um, and the methodology, but we based our grades on speed and reliability of buses. So how fast do they travel? How often do they arrive on schedule? How often do they come, you know, bunched together? Sometimes riders wait 30 minutes for a bus, and then they get three for the price of 30 minutes. Um, and so that was how we issued our grades. And there's a number of, of reasons buses have become slower and less reliable. Congestion is absolutely a cause of slower buses. Um, bus speeds have reduced, I, I believe, from 2015 to 2017. Bus speeds um, were at a, I think 2015, they were at speeds of an average of 7.3 miles an hour. Now they're at seven. Right. Um, bus bunching has gotten much worse, as you can see in the testimony as well. So that's really where we based our grades on, the things that riders care the most about. How fast is my bus traveling? Most of them are very slow. Definitely Bronx buses, often midtown buses, or cross, cross uh, town buses are some of the slowest as well. And I think this is why you mentioned the countdown uh, clocks, mm -hmm. which I was the first one to put them in the Bronx. And <laughs> uh, I loved them, people loved them, they're awesome. Uh, we, sh we should put a lot more uh, in the city. Uh, so thank you for, and also the question regarding the electric. Yes, absolutely, I appreciate the question. So we've looked at all types of alternative fuels and, and refueling and electrification has gotten a lot of attention in recent times. We've done an analysis looking at kind of the three important, as we see them, aspects. First being cost, second being kind of the operational realities, and the third is kind of the environmental public health climate impact. Uh, on all of those, electrification where it works is fantastic except on the cost front, and a lot of it's determined by the geography, the routes, the range. There are a number of variables that need to be considered. On the flip side, natural gas technology has been you know, proven out over the past decade plus, and we know it works. We know it's cost effective. The, the incremental cost for a, a natural gas bus is in the order of forty to $50,000, whereas an all-electric bus could be several hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So certainly it's being tested 
There are about 700 all-electric buses on the road across the country today, and there will be much more, and we'd love to see some in New York. But on the natural gas side, we can utilize ultra-low carbon biomethane made from waste in the 800 buses we have already and deployed in the infrastructure that's already there at minimal to no additional cost. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you. With that, I would like to, if I had a question, but before that, I would like to thank the ARP for being here, turning 30, uh, 53 in June. I hope to join your group very soon. But I also, I think that your role that you play, especially advocating for a senior citizen, is very important. You know, I want to bring a particular case when you talk about most of the 469 train station not being accessible, like in Dagman Street, number one train. If someone in a wheelchair will have to go to the one train, 233rd Street, they will have to take the one train, which has an elevator only going downtown, to 96th Street in order to transfer 96th Street and be able to go then all the way up to 231st. That's a reality, and I know that you are advocating together with the whole coalition to make our train station accessible, very important for all of us. And I also like to acknowledge, a, a, as I say, Riders Alliance for you know the big campaign and the coalition that you are leading. A, and with that also recognizing the TW, also Local 100 for the great job that you're doing because now that more funding will be allocated to the MTA, the question is how are we taking care of workers? Because they are the ones who are moving our city. So thank you for the job and we are always be here ready to work together with you. With that, I would like to thank uh, uh, my staff, uh, Jose Luis, Stefan Emiliano, Vladimir Acosta, and uh, welcoming also a student from City College, Xavier Acosta, who is here with us. With that, we finish. Uh, we will take a recess. And uh, at 12, the chairman of, of the taxi committee will be holding the hearing at 12. We will come back from the transportation committee at 3 p.m. to hear from the DOT commissioner who will be joining us. And now we will take a recess. Thank you.